In the 1950s, neuroscientists began a series of experiments, the results of which were so surprising that both scientists and philosophers are still struggling to understand what they mean. These experiments involved unique individuals who had undergone what was then a new form of brain surgery, which isolated the left and right hemispheres of their brain. In most cases, these subjects were sufferers of severe epilepsy, experiencing sporadic seizures often many times a day. The surgery severed their corpus callosum, the bridge of neural fibers which ordinarily connects their two hemispheres. Surgeons believed that the operation would alleviate their seizures by preventing the electrical storms of epilepsy passing from one side of the brain to the other. In this respect, the operation was often a success, with many of these subjects appearing entirely normal, but now finally free of their worst seizures. And yet, it was only under specific test conditions that an astonishing reality came into view that the two hemispheres of their brain, now isolated from each other, appear to have developed a distinct, individually conscious mind, capable of operating independently of the other side, two centers of consciousness now existing within the same person. As we will explore, this research, which would later win the Nobel Prize, carries far-reaching implications to our concepts of self, identity, and the deep structure of the human mind. Perhaps unsurprisingly, in split-brain patients, the two sides of the brain retain their unique functions. The left side, which in 95% of people is the language-dominant hemisphere, is able to articulate itself verbally. The right hemisphere, in a similarly high percent of individuals, lacks this function, and has little to no speech capabilities. It was, however, discovered that the right hemisphere does understand language and can still communicate using physical gestures such as pointing and drawing. To understand the full extent of this hemispheric independence, researchers devised methods of communicating exclusively with each hemisphere. Consider the following experiment with a split-brain subject. The first goal of the experiment is to present a piece of information exclusively to one hemisphere, in this case, the right. As it happens, the left and right visual fields direct to the opposite sides of the brain, so sending information to the right hemisphere can be achieved by presenting a word or image to the left visual field of the subject. In this experiment, the subject is instructed to stare at a dot on a screen, during which a word for example, tennis ball, is presented briefly to his left visual field, which in the split-brain patient now directs exclusively to his right hemisphere. Sure enough, when asked, the subject speaking through his left hemisphere reports having seen nothing. But when he is asked to reach with his left hand, which is controlled by his right hemisphere, behind a screen, and select the object corresponding to the word he has just been shown, he now effortlessly selects a tennis ball from a collection of other objects. If the subject is asked what he now holds in his hand, which is still behind the screen, he will report having no idea whatsoever. His left speaking hemisphere simply doesn't have that information. And yet the right hemisphere, acting independently, knows exactly what is being asked of it, and the object that is being held. Even more surprising is what happens if the object is then brought into view of the left hemisphere. If the subject is now asked why he chose the tennis ball, more often than not, the subject will reply by giving a confabulatory story which explains why he chose this particular object. Such as, I picked it because I played tennis with my father. Stranger still, the subject will appear to believe this explanation which was apparently just made up on the spot. Because of this bizarre confabulatory behavior, the left hemisphere has been referred to by researchers as the interpreter, because part of its role appears to be the creation of explanations. Despite these findings, split-brain patients often appear remarkably normal. 
There are, however, rare cases in which split-brain patients develop a condition known as intermanual conflict. In such individuals, the two hemispheres, each in control of the opposite side of the body, appear to hold conflicting intentions and proceed to fight over objects and undo each other's work. For example, a subject may be buttoning his shirt with one hand, while the other hand undoes his efforts. In a famous case of intermanual conflict, a man reached to embrace his partner with one hand, while the other aggressively pushed her away. As the study of split-brain patients continued, it became apparent that their two hemispheres could express very different personalities. The neuroscientist Michael Gazzaniga carried out studies in the early 1970s in which he posed questions to either one or the other hemisphere of a split-brain subject. Posed to his right hemisphere, one participant was asked his name and his desired profession, to which he responded by spelling out his name with Scrabble letters, and next to it the profession race car driver. And yet when the same question was posed to his speaking left hemisphere, his response was completely different. His left hemisphere apparently wanted to be a draftsman. Through further experiments, it also became apparent that the two hemispheres could hold deeply conflicting beliefs about the world, further suggestive of complex, independent thought on the part of each hemisphere. In a study conducted by neuroscientist V. S. Ramachandran, a split-brain subject verbally reported that he was an atheist. But when his right hemisphere was asked if he believed in God, his left hand, controlled by his right hemisphere, immediately pointed to the word yes. As Ramachandran described it, in split-brained individuals, there now exist two human beings in the same body, two spheres of consciousness. While it is true that some have pushed back against the notion that the two hemispheres of these patients are individually conscious, on the basis of all present findings, in which patients display astonishing hemispheric independence, differing behavioural intentions and rivalries, separate memories, and sometimes distinctly different personalities and beliefs, it is the view of those most closely involved in this research that consciousness is individually present in each hemisphere of these subjects, that as a result of their operation, they have now become two distinct conscious minds inhabiting the same body. It is worth noting that these findings do not commit us to a materialist explanation of the mind, where consciousness is viewed as no more than a byproduct of physical brain processes. In fact, the discovery that consciousness can be divided might even suggest it is a more fundamental property. Indeed, as we have explored in other episodes, a growing number of academics take seriously the possibility that consciousness is among nature's deep fundamentals, a feature of reality that science must ultimately expand to include. The psychiatrist and expert in hemispheric differences, Ian McGilchrist, has suggested that part of the materialist motivation to explain consciousness away as an illusion may in fact be a result of a larger civilizational problem, what he sees as the inflated dominance of the left hemisphere over our thinking, together with its intolerance of ambiguities and its need for immediate explanations of everything including of that about which it is ignorant. Whatever the ultimate nature of consciousness, perhaps the most profound implication of split-brain research is that if consciousness can be divided, then it can in principle also be combined. Might we one day discover a way of connecting two or more brains together? Could two individual minds truly be connected, and if so, could they retain their individuality? As it happens, there is already surprising evidence that the answer to these questions is yes. Part 2 – Combining Minds On October 25, 2006, the unique twins Krista and Tatiana Hogan were born. Prenatal scans revealed that their skulls were inoperably fused together making them the rarest of all types of conjoined twins. 
And yet it turned out that the Hogan sisters were entirely unique in another important respect. Not only were their skulls inoperably connected, so were their brains. The first hint that Krista and Tatiana shared a mental connection came within just hours of their birth. When one of the twins was given a pacifier, the other would also stop crying. Later scans revealed that the twins' brains were joined by what was termed a thalamic bridge. The team of surgeons who delivered the girls predicted only a low chance of their survival. And yet, against all of the odds, these unique twins survived, and fascinatingly, can now articulate the true extent of the connection they share. Krista and Tatiana can move each other's limbs, see through each other's eyes, sense each other's bodies, and even share private thoughts. When Krista is presented with an object, out of view of her sister, Tatiana also perceives the object and can say what it is. One twin can tell when the other is hungry or needs something, and the two often engage in a form of mental communication which they call talking in our heads. Krista, what's mommy holding? Uh, a, a piggy. <sighs> That's right, mommy's holding the piggy. <gasps> Despite their mental connection, the two sisters retain their individuality. Krista is energetic and outgoing, while Tatiana is more reserved and introverted. There is no doubt that while their minds are connected, both sisters are individually conscious. In all documented medical history, the Hogan sisters are the only recorded case of conjoined twins with functionally connected brains. It is only because of these twins that a very old philosophical assumption can finally be laid to rest. The belief that mind is an inherently private phenomenon. Because of Krista and Tatiana, we now know that this is not true. Their unique case reveals that minds can be truly connected, that sensations, information, even thoughts and ideas can in principle be coherently shared between the minds of individual brains. This raises the question, might we one day connect our minds to other conscious beings, using something like the thalamic bridge which connects Krista and Tatiana's brains? Whether or not such an ability would be achievable any time soon, it would seem that mental combination is a permitted reality of consciousness, something which can in principle occur. Indeed, as split-brain cases suggest, it may already be occurring within our own brains. In split-brain patients, we see two sides of a brain, each individually capable of supporting a distinct conscious mind that when severed from its neighbour, is poised and ready to act independently, as if the new situation was not altogether different from the way it had previously existed prior to the operation. Could it be that our left and right hemispheres are already two semi-autonomous minds, with distinct yet overlapping centres of consciousness? Could it be that each of us is already a combinatory entity? If so, then mental combination may be more than a speculative feat of future technology and something that the human mind has already evolved to do. To some, a world in which minds can be connected is a deeply unsettling idea. Would any privacy remain in such a world? Which of our relationships could survive a collision with our true feelings? A legitimate concern would also be the risk of totalitarian scenarios. Might an overbearing government seek to eliminate all dissent by demanding that its citizens surrender their mental sovereignty? Might the loss of mental privacy risk the creation of a truly inescapable failed world? The futurist David Pierce considers a more optimistic picture. If future humans could avoid these dangers, a mind-to-mind -mind technology could engender a new era in philosophy and ethics, a deeper understanding of personhood and identity, as well as a new and vital appreciation of the much larger state space of consciousness that awaits our exploration. For Pierce, 
an ability to truly see things from another person's perspective would be the ultimate tool of diplomacy and conflict resolution. As he writes, quote, The ability to meld your mind with that of your enemy through interthalamic bridges would open up a reciprocal understanding that would convert any sense of conflict. Our descendants will have windows into each other's souls, so to speak. End quote. Such an ability may not be limited to members of our own species. Might the creation of an interspecies thalamic bridge also be possible, granting new insights into the now mysterious inner lives of other conscious creatures? Might we one day finally arrive at a definitive answer to the classic philosophical question, what is it like to be a bat? Perhaps more significantly, we could finally resolve any remaining ambiguity that other animals are truly conscious, that they experience their life in the world with the same felt intimacy as we do. It seems likely that this would dissolve much of our apathy towards their experiences, including the suffering caused in those species we now systematically enslave. A further speculation is that a sufficient integration between brains might collapse multiple minds into one. What would be the experience of this new combinatory entity? Would it be coherent or chaotic? Would it have the combined intelligence of its two or more subjects? And more importantly, would this be ethical? Might cutting the network be considered a kind of murder? Among all of these possibilities, perhaps the most significant implications are to our view of self. If the experiences of another mind could be as intimately felt as our own, the traditional idea of the self begins to lose its viability. To illustrate, imagine if we could share our memories. What if you could recall a formative moment in the halcyon youth of your father? Might the day eventually come when among our most cherished memories are some which first belonged to another person, a person who may no longer be alive. In such circumstances, what would happen to our idea of the self? The concept of the self is a complex philosophical issue that thinkers have debated for millennia. There is a sense in which other people are as distinct from us as we are to ourselves at different times in our lives. It is our apparent continuity that creates our sense of self. But as many philosophers have pointed out, each of us changes dramatically through the course of our lives. We change our views, beliefs, attitudes and relationships, and all the while our selves continually die and are replaced. What most ties me to the child in the picture is that I vaguely recall some of his experiences, his bundle of hopes and anxieties before his first day at school. But what happens to this view of self if memories can be shared? What if I possessed an equally vivid memory of my father's first day at school? Would a tenuous physical continuity still command our idea of who we are? It seems likely that in a future of shared experiences, the idea of a continuous self belonging to one distinct subject would eventually be replaced with the more unitary identity of consciousness itself, the tapestry upon which all subjective experience arises. The self may finally be viewed more accurately as an appearance within consciousness, that mysterious natural phenomenon by which the universe becomes aware.